now. Let's see, someone wants to be added at the last minute, so let's do that quickly. Add member. But we have to wait for an email address. Okay, apparently this person doesn't have an email address. Yeah, pretty good. We invite people. Hmm. Should I be able to hear you guys? I don't know. Can you, do you have a microphone? Can I hear you? I don't know. Cause I don't know if my laptop speaker is broken. Ah, okay, Benelli. Awesome. Let me go add Benelli. Teams. Rhinestone. Pretty sure he was on. 24. Yeah, he already was added to the team. He already was added to the team. Ah, I can hear someone now, and I think I remember. Cool. Uh, so yeah, guys, we're just going to wait until 2 to start, obviously, so more people can join. Everyone can figure out what's going on. Yeah, he's online. What is he talking about? Ask to join. Wait, can they see us? Um, I can see you, yeah. <laughs> oh, Is it okay if I turn off my camera? Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you. Oh, WhatsApp group. Gotcha. Yeah, next time. Okay. <laughs> Create contact. BFT. Again. A few more people should be joining. Yeah, guys, we're going to do same time every week, same day as well, unless said otherwise on the WhatsApp group. So just treat it as a normal lecture now. Just log into Microsoft Teams at 2 and join the lecture. Okay. Doesn't have to be. Can you show an example of console.readline? I will do. Um, today we're going to go through a bunch of example questions to start prepping you guys for um, the test on section one. Um, but the test, we created a test. This test does not count for marks. It's just to gauge where you are, okay? Just to gauge how well you guys are doing. Um, only the final test, the big test in November, that's the one that counts. And that's on all the sections. 
but we just want to between each each section give you guys a little test to make sure everyone's keeping up um, and so today we're going to do sort of revision of section one and go through a bunch of the t the trick questions that you can be asked in a multiple choice test and um, so yeah hopefully we'll do that okay and then next week I'm going to give you guys a proper little assessment that you can answer yourselves this week I'm going to go through this with you um, and we'll do it all together see uh, when is the test um, it depends which one you mean so our little pretend assessment that doesn't count for marks I'm going to give that to you at the beginning of next week's lecture okay but that's just to gauge where you are um, the actual test the one that counts your for your certificate um, will probably be in November okay well, that'll probably be in November so long away by then you guys will be totally okay with all this stuff okay um, Cool. Just going to wait for a few more people to join. How many people did we have last week? I forgot. Some uh, was it fourteen or fifteen? Um, I, th I think it was like fifteen. Um, so let me wait just a few more minutes, even though we would be starting a bit late. Although I remember Benele last week joined after an hour and five minutes or something. So I, I don't know. Maybe some people will take their time to find the lecture. I mean, I think since we're doing an assessment, we can just go through with it, okay? Um, so let's just do that. Can you guys see my screen? Can one of you post in the chat if you can see my screen? Or just say something? Yes, 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 cool. All right, so let's get cracking then. Okay, so this is test prep. Okay, that's what we're doing today. Or rather, section one prep, you could say. Right, so I've gotten a whole bunch of questions. You guys do need your textbooks today. Okay, so go to page 27 of your textbook, page 27 of the textbook, and you'll see at the bottom there is a thing called knowledge assessment. Okay, knowledge assessment. We're going to go through the knowledge assessment, every single question, and discuss the answers and discuss why some of the questions are difficult why some of them are easy we're going to go through every question and make sure we all are on the same page okay that's what we're doing today so go to does everyone have their textbook page 27 of the textbook please go there um, okay I hear some textbooks being gathered in the background so that's good while people do that we can give some more people okay cool so for some a few new faces have joined okay let me let me just print screen 13 okay that's two fewer people than last last time but that's totally chilled let's see what's going on here it says something went wrong on there on, on where I don't know who, what the person's talking about. Okay, uh, why did Connor leave? Okay, um, okay, 15, this is how many people I expect to have, and Benele is here now. Awesome. Okay, so, I think let's get cracking. All right. Cool. So for those of you who just joined, please get your textbook. Okay. Go get into your textbook on page 27. As we go through each question, fill in the answers in your textbook. Okay. So actually write them in so you have all of the answers and you can refer back to this when you're studying. Okay. So page 27 of the textbook, we're going to go through every single question in the knowledge assessments. All right. So what that means, there are 10 fill-in-the-blank questions on page 27. On the next pages, 28 and 29, there are 10 multiple choice questions. And then on the last page, there are four more challenging scenario questions. Okay. Now, in your test in November, 
the only questions that you would actually be given are multiple choice and fill in the blank okay you won't be given scenario questions all right so but obviously the scenario questions really help you understand the concepts better so we will go through them as well all right is everyone okay to get started is everyone particularly worried about anything 15 people that's good stuff it's, it's, it's okay cool everyone's everyone's fine okay feel free to turn on your microphone and stop me but I will stop at every single question if I think of, if I think it's difficult and we're gonna discuss it all right and I want you guys to answer with me all right um, so in so far as it's possible we're going to make this cooperative okay so question one of the fill in the blank questions on page 27 okay the M statement selects for execution a statement list having an associated associated label that corresponds to the value of an expression. Okay. The M statement selects for execution a statement list having an associated label that corresponds to the value of an expression. Okay, now how this is worded makes it seem difficult but I'm telling you, you guys know the answer to this question, okay? Even though you might think you don't. And so now we're gonna, st we're already gonna start noticing the pattern throughout all of these questions. Because it's multiple choice, the way that they make it difficult, uh, close, okay, the, the way that they'd make it difficult is that they um, word it in a difficult way, okay? So they try to trick you. All right, but I'm going to show you how to get over some of these tricks. Okay, so um, let's think about this. Someone said if statements. Okay, so how do we know that that person is thinking along the right line? Okay, so we've got this term value of an expression. All right, so and we have this word selects. Okay, so we're thinking about making a decision. Okay, we have values and we want to select something. Okay, so now we've immediately, just from analyzing those two terms, we've reduced the possible number of answers. Okay, We're, there are only two decision structures that we have learned. There are two of them. There was an if statement and there was, what was the other one? Someone type it in the chat. What was the other decision structure that we covered? Because remember, there were, there were two of them. Well, there's an if-else statement. That's the same thing, though. There was another one, though, that, that allowed us to decide if we had a whole bunch of values, allowed us to go through each of them and go, is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? Do you guys remember? Um, let me describe what we did with this instead. So we, we went through, we, we gave it an animal name, and it gave us back the sound that the animal made. We also did one where we gave it um, a direction and it gave us back, well, we gave it N, S, W, or E, and it gave us back North, South, West, East. Um, okay, so how do you know it's not an if statement? Okay, so they say that it selects for execution from a list. Okay, so you give it a list switch statement. That's the one. Yeah, okay. Um, switch statements. All right. Okay, are we happy with that, guys? Like, uh, but understand that there were two possible answers, right? And they were trying to trick you. So you immediately got that it was a decision. So you jumped to the if statements. Okay. But you have to remember that here we're selecting from a list. Okay. So it's the switch statements. All right. Um, do you guys want to do an example of a switch statement? I think we've done enough rights and you can you can go reference that But maybe if we have time at the end we can do a quick switch statements. Okay um, Anyway Cool, so the second one the mm loop tests the condition at the bottom of the loop instead of at the top Ooh, No, 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 so so what were it, it's not the for loop Okay, let's let's think about what this is asking. Okay, let's think about the loops we have and think about how they're written. Okay, we have while condition code. 
right? Can some one of you has some um, noise in the background? Can you mute yourself, please? So we've got um, while loop, okay? But wait, but does the while loop check at the top, Connor? Thelma, does the while loop check at the top or the bottom? So this is saying the m loop tests the condition at the bottom of the loop instead of at the top. So this is, we've, we've learned about, ah, okay, such an, yes, yes, the Charleses have got it, yeah. It is the do while loop. Okay, so remember what the difference between a do while and a while is, right? The do while checks the condition after it's run. And so think about how you type it, okay? You type while and then the condition and then your code right so that's the while loop the do while loop we say do the code and then the while with the condition right so the condition is literally at the bottom of the loop and that's what this question is asking okay so it's worded differently to how we learnt it but you guys are right this is the do while loop okay um all right this next one, you guys won't know the answer to. Okay, the only operator that takes three arguments is the m mm operator. Okay, so let me also mention this. When we were covering section one, there are a bunch of things that you can, you would only get asked in a multiple choice test in order to make it difficult. That's that's basically what's going on with this one. Okay. So I'm going to show you um, this this operator, what they mean by operator. Okay, so firstly, um, so this is question three. The answer to this question you would find on, let's see, uh, page 10. It's on page 10. Mm. Yeah, page 10. Okay, so this is a very weird thing. I don't know why C sharp has it, which is why we didn't really discuss it. Okay, so I'm going to just show you how it works and show you what they mean. Okay, when they're asking this question, what they mean by this question. Okay, so we have just opening up .NET Fiddle, which we've been using for a while now. Okay, get it back to where it starts, make sure that's working, yeah. Cool. So, what I'm gonna show you um, is, I, I'm gonna explain what this question means on the, on the first part. It, oh yes, yes, that's right. You can read on the page. The answer is ternary, Jatin. Um, but you see, this is such a silly question because when you're actually programming, you'll almost never use something like this. But remember that this is a trick question, okay? So if they say an operator that takes three things, um, then you just know it's the ternary operator. There's only one of them. You'll almost never use it. It's just a little trick question that they like asking in multiple choice tests, okay? Um, so let's see. Um, so I'm glad that from the page you guys were able to see what the answer was. That's very cool. Um, but let's also just see how this is actually used so that we're not just, you know, guessing. Okay. Um, okay, so, and also see what the question actually means. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of operators that we're familiar with, right? Equals, equals is an operator. Greater than or equals to is an operator. Greater, thas, greater than is an operator. Right. So let's say I have two two variables. Int x equals. Uh, far, actually, let's just use one variable. It's simpler to explain that way. Okay. Notice that with every single one of the other operators we've learned, right? Not equals to. Oh, sorry. Not equals to. Less than or equals to. Okay. With all of these other operators, you put something on the left and something on the right. Okay. You'll put something on the left and something on the right. You'll put something on the left and something on the right, something on the left, um, something on the right, something on the left, um, something on the right. Okay, so all of these 
are taking two things, right? X and whatever I'm comparing it to, right? You put something on the left, something on the right. They take two. So what this question means when what they're trying to ask you is which operator is the only operator, there's only one of them, the only operator that takes two instead of, um, that takes three instead of two, okay? And it's this operator and it's called the ternary operator, okay? What does the ternary operator actually do? Um, it's basically a, an if statement almost. So we could do something like string um, response, let's try response equals, again, you never, ever, ever, ever use this, okay, but it's kind of like a, let me just see, will that work, x greater than 4, make sure that I'm typing this correctly, greater than 4, x less than or equal to 4. Okay. So this this is how you use it. Okay. It's very silly. Okay, but this what I'm telling you is this is the ex exactly the same as a for loop, as an if statement. Okay? It's exactly the same as an if statement. Um, so what this what this line of code here is is doing, okay? What this line of code here is doing um, is is what an if statement does okay so basically with the question mark the first part of the operator you ask a question x greater than 4 then you say x greater than 4 so the answer to your question if it's true okay the answer to your question if it's true then then you say this and the answer to your question if it's false okay that's all this means okay and so they're saying, and you can see this question mark colon takes um, three things, right? It takes this bit, the condition, takes this bit, the response if it's true, and it takes this bit, the response if it's false, okay? You will never, ever use a ternary operator, okay? Almost never. You'll always just use an if statement instead because it's much neater. But this is what it does, okay? That's what it does. Okay, let me leave this on the screen for a bit because it would it is a bit difficult to understand okay so we say we create a variable its name is X its type is int, its value is 5 okay I say string response so I create another variable right response is its name its type is string okay we say equal okay I say this response is equal to all right and I give it this Cool. So what does this mean? What this is saying is x greater than 4, if it's greater than 4, so it's asking a question and you can see it's got a little question mark after it. Okay, question. x greater than 4. If this is true, then make responses value x greater than 4. Okay, which is a string. Okay. If it's not true, then look at the other side of the colon. And make x and make responses value x less than or equal to four. Okay, less than, less than or equal to four. Okay, so in this case, if I say um, console, if I print out, okay, console dot right line response. Okay, um, this will print out. Okay, so it'll, what will it do? It'll say x equals 5. Okay, string response equals, if x is greater than 4, x's value is 5, right? 5 is greater than 4. Then we pick the true one, and so it'll make a, um, response x greater than 4. And you'll see when I print out the response, you can see it is x greater than 4. Okay, that is what the ternary operator does. You do not need to know how to use it. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen them ask how to use a ternary operator, although now you do know how to use it. But um, what you must know about it is that it takes three arguments. Okay, that's, that's what we call arguments. It takes the condition, answer if it's true, answer if it's false. But otherwise, just think about this as an if statement. 
The reason I didn't show it to you guys earlier is because it's confusing and silly, basically. Um, but the only way they ever ask this is, which operator takes three arguments? And you can just say, it's this one, question mark, colon, and that is called the ternary operator. All right. Anyway, is, are you guys okay with that? It's not, um, it's not too bad. And, and yeah, now you guys know the answer even from yourselves in the textbook, okay? So that's good. Cool, so the answer is ternary. All right. The m loop is the most common way to iterate through items in a collection. In a collection. Okay, again, you see how they make these difficult is they try to trick you. So we aren't going to be test you they might ask you that question. So they might ask you um uh what is the name of the only operator that takes three? Okay? They might ask you that takes three arguments. They'll ask you a question like that, and you must know it's called ternary. But you don't have to be able to actually, you know, do a ternary yourself. For each, for each, for each, you guys are right. Cool. Um, that is correct. So, why, how, how did they make this question a little bit tricky? When you learn for each loops, you learn that they work on arrays. Okay, arrays and lists and here they use the word collection okay so they're just trying to trick you the answer is for each okay through items in a collection you can just replace collection with array whenever you see it okay and then if you know what a for each loop is you'll know that 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 is the correct answer in that case all right next on a 32-bit computer a variable of int data type takes m bytes of memory. m bytes of memory. How many bytes of memory does an int take? Four. Exactly. That is correct. Okay. It does take four. Where do we see that? And and how do we how do we understand that? We can see. Um, okay. How many? How? I have another question for you guys. How many bytes? How, I mean, how many bits are in a byte? How many bits are in a byte? Eight. That's correct. Yeah, so there are eight bits in a byte. Okay, so four. So if we have four bytes, how many bits do we have? 32, right? 32. So on a 32-bit computer, yeah, exactly. So we're good. Um... So, that question is answered on page 9. Alright, page 9, and you can go through the column, you go find whatever data type you're thinking about, and you can see how many bytes are in the data type, okay? But it's also best to just sort of understand the ranges, rather than um, memorizing the number of bytes, right? Because you can see it sort of makes sense. Look, you can say something like, so, so there's a byte data type. How many bytes are in the byte data type? One byte, obviously. Okay. Um, a char, so one character, that takes two bytes to store. Okay. A short, a short number, takes two bytes to store. And then we have, so we have short ints and longs, right? And we just double each time. Okay. So a short takes two bytes, an int takes four bytes, and a long takes eight bytes. Okay. So it's quite it's quite logical in that way, okay? Um, a float takes four bytes, and a double takes double what a float takes, eight bytes, okay? Um, and a boolean takes... <laughs> let's not go into why it takes two bytes, okay? Anyway, so we've got we've got that, all right? So just sort of under just try to remember. Um, you only have to remember the basic ones, though, right? If you remember how many bytes a short uses, then an int just takes double that, and a long just takes double what an int takes, okay? Um, so you only have to remember the smallest one, right? If, if you know a float takes four bytes, then you know a double takes double that, eight bytes, okay? So, 
Are we good with that? Four bytes is the correct answer. Okay, so those are the first five questions. Other than the ones you hadn't been shown before, but the, the, so the, the ternary one, they're not too bad, right? They, they try to trick you with the wording, but if you understand each concept, you should be able to answer the questions, right? Um, yeah, the, the ternary one, it's an easy question, right? You just have to remember there's only one operator that takes more than two arguments, that takes three arguments, and it's the ternary operator. Okay, it's an easy question to answer if you know the answer. All right, if you if you've been told, it's just memorizing basically. Okay, but these other questions, if you know what a switch statement is, that first question is easy to answer. If you know what a do while loop is, that second question is easy to answer. Question four is easy to answer if you know what a for each loop is, and question five is easy to answer if you're familiar with your data types. Okay. Nothing too bad. All right, question six. To access the first elements of an array, you use an index of what? You guys should know this one. Everyone should know this one. So the first element of an array, you use an index of, well, that's empty, Connor. That's not accessing anything. What, what do you have to put in those square brackets to access the first element? Okay, if I have an array called names, and it has three names in it, how do I get the first name out of the array? Yeah, but what do you put in the square brackets? Hmm. Ooh, you guys are struggling. Position zero. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully... Uh, remember, that was in one of our slides where we would have a list of names, okay, and names in position zero, names at index zero was something, names at index one was something, names at index two was something, right? And the big thing to remember is that we start counting at zero, okay? The zeroth index in the array is the first one, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Hopefully we will remember that from now on, okay? Cool. That's not a difficult question though, guys. That's, that's a free mark, free free mark, okay? Number seven. M is a programming technique that causes a method to call itself in order to compute a result. Okay, we learned about this um, very recently. So, so again, they word it in a difficult way. All right, they word it in a difficult way because that's the only way to make this question difficult. Okay, so you can ignore this term programming technique. You can ignore that causes. You can ignore a. Uh, you can ignore itself you can all in order to compute a result all you needed to know all you need to see in the sentence is method call itself method call itself when does a what do we call it when a method calls itself do you remember when we did this last week recursion recursion that is the answer okay so let's just do, let's just write out what that means. Maybe someone missed last week's lecture or something. Um, can say, if I create a, create a new method, right? I say static um, void, I'll call my function foo, okay? Uh, my method or function, okay? Uh, let's say it takes in a number called n, and then it just calls itself, okay? So inside foo, I type foo. Okay, so I, foo is calling foo. Okay. So when a method does this, when a method calls itself, we call that recursion. Okay. Again, so you just, we, we did cover that last week. So it's when, when a method calls itself, we call that recursion. Okay, that's what that question is testing you, uh, testing you on. 
do you know that? Okay, so the answer to that question is recursion. All right. Mm. Are data fields or local variables that cannot be modified? Okay, I'm, I'll be very impressed if anyone remembers this, because this is the first lecture. <laughs> the first lecture we mentioned it. Ooh, no, no, no. So those are things we import. Good, good guess, though. That is something we covered in the first lecture. No, so this is something you put before your data types, okay? So let's, let's see. I don't think anyone will remember this. Um, it was very long ago. Okay, so if I create a variable, something like this, int x equals zero. Okay, so I'm saying I've got a variable, its name is x, its type is int, and its value is zero. Okay, currently I can change this, right? Like here I can say x equals six. Okay, I can do this, and then x's value becomes six when the code gets to this line, right? If I don't want you to be able to do this, if I don't want you to be able to change the value of this, okay, if I don't want you to be able to change the value of x, there's a special word, const, okay, and now you see it immediately highlights it, and, and it won't allow you to change this, okay. This word const, it just stands for constant, right, unchanging, constant, okay. And all it does is it makes the variable constant. It can't change. Um, four. Four. Okay. So const, const is the answer. Constants. Exactly. Yeah. You can say const or constants. I just put const because it fits in the box nicer. But, but that is the answer. It's constants. All right. So constants cannot be changed, all right? And now, now that you've seen it, you'll always get that kind of question right, right? It's just the kind of thing you need to remember, all right? Constants are variables that cannot be changed or data fields that cannot be changed, all right? And it makes sense. It's a good name for them. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Next question. When an algorithm involves a large number of conditions, a in M is a compact and readable format for presenting the algorithm. Okay, again, very tricky way to ask this question. Very tricky. But you guys will hit yourself if you don't know the answer to this question because it's very easy. Um, it's one of the... So if I have a very complicated algorithm and there's a whole bunch of decisions that I need to make, okay, I need to go like... Um, if this is true, then do this. If this is true, then do this. If this is true, then do this. What is a simple way that I can display all of these decisions in? A simple way to display all of those decisions. What would I use? It's not, it's not in code. What is the word that... I might have to give you guys a hint. Because they do ask it in a very tricky way. No, 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 no. It's not in code, hey? So, like, ah, okay, Suchin's on the right track. Okay. Um, Suchin's on the right track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Decision table. That's correct. See, it's a very easy question. Okay, and now that you see that the answer is decision table, it's so simple. It's so simple, actually. You can go, when an algorithm involves a large number of conditions, mm, is a compact a decision table is a compact and readable format for presenting the algorithm. Okay, quite. It's a simple question. It really is. It's just that they word it in a complicated way. All right, a decision table is the answer. Okay. A N M is a graphical representation of an algorithm. What graphical representations of algorithms do we have? Flowcharts. That's correct. That's that one's flowcharts. Okay. Cool. And that's all the fill in the blank questions done. Okay. So there are two that you guys wouldn't have been familiar with, right? Const. We've only discussed once since we even started this whole course, so I wouldn't expect you to get that. And ternary operator. I only just showed you now. Okay. But those those are the fill in the blank questions. Okay. And they're not too bad. And you'll see. 
questions in all the tests are very similar because there's only, only so many things we can ask you. Okay, but you, what you must remember is that um, how they make these questions difficult is just wording. Okay, so you must just ignore most of the words. Okay, like in question eight, we just see variables that cannot be modified. Const, easy. Okay, in the recursion one, we just see method call itself. Easy, that's recursion. Okay. Um, a large number of conditions, compact and readable format for pre presenting an algorithm, decision table, graphical representation of an algorithm, flowchart, right? Easy stuff. Uh, so, everyone okay with that? Those are the fill in the blanks questions. I'm glad you got pretty much all of the others eventually after some hints. Um, but yeah, it's uh, again, the wording is tricky. The wording is tricky. But as you practice, you get better at ignoring all of the stuff that they try to put there to trick you. Okay, cool. So let's continue on to the next page. Um, this is now page 28. Okay, we're now on page 28. Okay, page 28. Okay, page 28, everyone's there. Okay, we can continue with um, what this. All right. So, <laughs> this, this is another tricky question, okay? They're not showing you anything new. You'll be familiar with this, but this is the only way you can make multiple choice difficult, okay? So, let's, let's see this code here. They say, write the following code snippet, okay? Int n equals 20, okay? So they create an integer. Um, its name is n, and its value is 20. Not too bad, right? Then on the next line, they say, int d equals... So they create a new integer, its name is D, okay? And they want to set it equal to N plus plus, okay? N plus plus, plus five. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so you guys are answering 26, and actually I'm glad that you're answering 26, okay? In a way, I'm glad that you're answering 26 because it means you know what n plus plus means, right? n plus plus means n plus 1, right? Or n equals n plus 1. But this is a trick question. Okay, so I'm going to show you another, another, um, uh, let's do a little code example. So let's actually program up what they just gave us. Okay, so we say int, did they call the first variable n and the second? Yeah, so int n equals 20. Okay, they say int n equals 20. And then they say int d equals n plus 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 5. Okay. Cool. And then we're just going to print out, I'm just going to print out d. Okay. Console dot right line d. Okay. Let's see what C sharp does. Okay. And it gives us 25. Okay. Why does it give us 25? So let me let me show you something. Um, console dot right line. Okay, I'm going to create a variable. It's called n equals twenty. Okay, so there's a variable. Its name is n, and its value is twenty. Okay, we're going to say n plus plus. Okay, I'm going to print out n plus plus okay see it prints out 20 weird hey now let's try this let me say here i'm going to say n plus plus okay before the print and i'm just going to print out n okay when i run this it prints out 21 okay so it, it actually, surprisingly, you'll see it does make sense. Okay, 
So let me let me show you what's going on here. Okay, in this console dot write line. Okay, so when I run this, it prints out twenty. So we create a variable. Its its name is n. Its value is twenty, and then I print out n plus plus. Okay, so what this does is it reads n. Okay, and it goes oh twenty. Okay, it reads n, sees it as twenty, and then it adds one to it. Okay. But remember, the thing, so it reads it before it adds one. Okay, so the plus plus is after the n. So it reads n before it adds one to it. Okay, so that's what's happening there. It's, but picture it, so read it from left to right, okay? You have n first, and then you add 1. Okay, So it reads 20, and then adds 1 to it. But you don't, see the tw you don't see the 21. After you've added 1 to it, you've already read it. It doesn't read it again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it is a bit of a trick. Okay. And there is a second side of this. Okay, But you must just remember, read it from left to right. The computer reads it in the exact same way. Okay. So look, we'll say instead of n plus plus, if I say plus plus n, okay, plus plus n, now it prints out 21. Okay. So what's happening here is the computer reads from left to right. It reads, okay, add 1, and then it reads the n. Okay. So add 1 prints out Okay. Do you guys see? So Connor sees it. Do you guys um, see what's going on here? It's a, it's a bit tricky, but it's quite easy to understand once you've seen it before again. It's one of those kinds of questions. Okay, so we read from left to right. Okay, so here we go, when we say n plus plus, we read the n, which is 20. Okay, it prints out the 20, and then it adds 1. Okay, so it returns whatever n's value is, and then it adds 1 to it. Okay. If we put the plus plus first, then it adds 1 to n, and then returns it. Okay. So it's just which side of the variable is the plus plus. Okay. Can I do it this way? Okay, no, it has to be in front of a variable. Makes sense, because it has to be saved somewhere, obviously. Okay. But do you guys see that? So, like, it will say 20, only then sees plus on... Never mind, I get it now. I'm still confused. Okay, cool. Um, let's, let's spend a bit more time playing with this. Okay, so... And, and there's, there's a lot of ways they can ask this question, okay? So, if n's value is 0, okay, and I print out n, okay? You can see it just goes ahead, it reads n, and reads it as 0, okay? Cool. If I print out n plus plus, it reads n still. You can see the n is first. Okay, it reads n. Okay, let me do it this way. Ah, this this will this might show this might help some people get it. Okay, so now I'm printing out I'm printing something twice, right? I'm printing something twice. Okay, so I create n. Its value is zero. All right. I say console dot right line n all right so it reads n n is 0 okay it's going to print out 0 it then adds 1 to it then adds 1 the plus plus it adds 1 to n okay when i go to the next line i print out n again but this time n's value will be 1 okay because n has had 1 added to it so you see that this prints out 1 0 oh you can't see it below the advert there this prints out, I mean, it prints out 0, 1. Okay, 0, 1. Does that help anyone understand? Are you guys all okay with this? So in maths, would it look like this? Plus 1, 20, plus 5. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense, I guess, because the plus isn't on the, on the right side. Yeah, yeah. You can think of it that way. 
it's probably easier to just think of it as reading left to right there, okay? So it returns the, if the variable is first followed by the plus plus, then it returns the variable and then adds one. If the plus plus is on the left, then it adds one and then returns the variable. Okay, that's all that's happening really. Okay, so if we go back to their little example and you can see how it is a bit tricky. Okay. Okay, cool. Can you get it now? That's good. Um, all right. So, see, let's let's look at this more. Okay. So we say int n equals twenty. We say int d equals n plus plus, and it just reads twenty. It then adds one to n, but we're no longer working with n. It's already read twenty. It adds five to it to get twenty-five and then it prints out 25, all right? And you can see we go 25, okay? If we put the plus plus first, so I say plus plus n, now it'll be 26, okay? So do you guys get how, and they can ask a bunch of trick questions on, on, on that, okay? I understand now, I totally understand this now. Okay, awesome. Great stuff, great stuff. Okay, so just read left to right. Okay, cool. So that's that's one tricky thing handled, and they ask those kind. They'll ask this kind of trick a lot. Um, and but but now that you know, yeah, if it's if the plus plus is first, okay, then it will add first and then read. If the variable is first, then it'll read and then add. All right. So so the answer to this question is twenty five. Okay, a. A is the answer to the first question. Cool. So, second question. Write the following code snippets. Okay, we have a while loop. Int i equals 5. While i less than 5. Console.writeLine i. i++. Plus plus. And all they want us to find out is how many times will the while loop in the code snippet be executed? Okay. Okay. This one, you guys, okay, yeah, people are already saying, let's get some more answers in. Yeah, okay, you guys are very confident on this. I'm glad we covered this a lot, and that is correct. The answer is four. Shall we, let's go see, um, let's go see. Okay, I'm going to create it. I'm going to say int i equals one, right, while i less than five. Okay, console.writeLine, i, i++, okay, something like that. When I run this, it prints out 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, it runs four times, okay. Remember, you can get a little tricky if you say i less than or equal to 5. If it was less than or equal to 5, then it runs on 5 as well, okay. So then it would be five times, okay? So you just have to pay attention to where the loop stops, how many times it goes up by, and where it ends, okay? But in this case, that was a super easy one. And yeah, the answer is four. I'm glad everyone seemed to have gotten it, so that's fantastic, okay? The answer is C, four. All right. Question three. Write out the following code snippets what output, output will be displayed after this code snippet is executed. <clears throat> All right, a bit tricky again, okay? Um, because this is not what an if statement usually looks like, right? Um, you can see they have no curly brackets. So what does that mean? Okay, I'm gonna move this back because my back is super sore. So, so what does it mean when they have no, no curly brackets? It's a tough one, okay. And and we haven't seen this before, okay. So let's let's actually go. The answer. Ooh, okay. Someone's confidence. Let's let's see. Okay. So immediately, immediately we can say we can rule out some answers. Okay. Even if we don't know the answer properly, we can say. It's, it's not D, right? It's definitely not D, okay? That's the one answer we can rule out, okay? 
what, how can we rule out D? You can't see the screen. Okay, well, we're on... You can follow through in your textbook. We're on question three, kind of. Okay. Um, how can we how can we rule out D? We can rule out D because how could it... The thing is in the way, so what thing? Oh, oh right. This, oh, right, okay. Oh, you're saying that you can't see the code. Okay, okay, I got you, I got you, I got you. Okay, I'll, I'll close down, I, which, just so that I can see the chat as well. I mean, maybe I can resize this. Uh, mission. Let me try resizing. Why wouldn't it resize? That's annoying. Come on, there we go. Okay, this way I can see the chat and you can see the code. But yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, so um, let's let's do this. So, hmm. Okay, why isn't it D? Okay, let's let's go through and rule out answers. Okay, it's not D because there is no way number two could be printed before number one, right? If we look in the code console.write line number one, console.write line number two. Okay? So if both print it out, number one would always be before number two. Right? If only one of them prints out, okay, then then still you would either have number one or number two. There is no way number two could be before number one. Right? We can see that. Ooh, I should have um put those in quotation marks. So sorry, in the slides, number one and number two aren't in quotation marks. They should be, obviously, because they're strings. You can see in your book that they are. So I'll update my slides. Um, anyway, so it can't be D, right? Um, let's see. Could it be A? I, th I think we can rule out A as well. Okay. So it, just from what we know already. So the question that's being asked here, basically, what this question is trying to test is, is do you know what happens if an if statement does not have curly brackets? Okay, that's what they're testing here. Okay, so look, um, if we go if we go back into code, I'm going to actually code it up so that we can see. Okay, so we have int number one equals they say 10 okay int number two equals 20 okay this we're okay with we know how to create variables by now I'm gonna zoom out sorry if you guys struggle more to see okay int number one equals 10 int number two equals 20 okay we can then say something like um, well let's 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 do what they do first so they say if okay number two greater than number one okay they do not put curly brackets right whenever we use if statements we always put curly brackets because that's how you're supposed to do it but they don't here okay and they say prints out um, number one console dot right line number two okay cool so what are they what are they testing here they're testing do you know what happens with an if statement when there are no curly brackets okay what happens when there are no curly brackets so we can let's let's experiment with this okay so if we run this now with no curly brackets, you can see it prints out number one, number two. Okay, but this doesn't actually tell us what's happening. Okay, so the answer is C in their case. But I want to show you what they're testing here. Okay, so let me instead do this. I'm gonna instead of making number two twenty, right? Number two greater than number one. Okay, I'm gonna make number two less than number one okay I'm gonna make it nine alright 
So before, when number 2 was 20, 20 is greater than 10. So this operator here was true, right? Now this is false, okay? And now when I run this, it just prints out number 2, okay? So this is beyond your textbook now. The textbook answer is C, okay? The answer in the textbook is C. We're, we're experimenting now to see what's going on here, okay? So what happens, what is happening when this if statement does not have curly brackets, okay? So what happens in this case is that C sharp will go until, let's say, how should I put it? It'll go until the first semicolon it sees, which basically means it will go to the end of the first line after the if statement. Okay, so basically this structure here, this if number two equal, greater than number one with no curly brackets, this is the same as doing this. Putting a curly bracket there and a curly bracket there, this is the same. Okay, so when an if statement doesn't have curly brackets, okay, when an if statement doesn't have curly brackets, it just goes for the first line and that is the code that it sees as its as its code okay the code that it will run if its condition is true all right let me explain it another way because if it's the first time um, but yeah do you, post in the chat if you guys are, are getting this so without curly brackets this line here, this first line, only will only execute, will only execute if true. Okay. Will always execute. And by true, I mean number two greater than number one okay number two is greater than do you guys okay so Ham understands that's good I don't know if I completely understand okay okay let's let's um let's explore this a bit more then okay I'm gonna move away from the textbook example okay I'm just going to create a variable called x, okay? Int x greater than, I'm just going to make x equal to 5, okay? Int x equals 5, all right? That we're familiar with. I'm going to create an if statement how we normally create it, okay? x greater than 5. So let's say if x is greater than 4, then console.writeLine, um, x is greater than 4, x is greater than 4. Okay, so currently this will print out x is greater than 4. Okay, because x is 5, we say if x is greater than 4, then print this out. Okay, if I make x 3, this will not print out, right? Nothing happens. Cool. So what I'm trying to explain here is if I take away the curly brackets. Okay. If I take away those two curly brackets, this is still fine. This, even without that tab, this means the same thing. Okay, can see nothing prints out. If I make it five, x is greater than four. Okay, so what's happening here is that when the if statement doesn't have curly brackets, when it doesn't have the curly brackets that show it what code it must run when it's true, it just takes the first line. Yeah, you don't need, well, you don't need the curly brackets if you're not going to have an else statement. Okay. But it'll only take the first line. Okay. The next, if, if you want more than one line of code in your if statement, it won't, it won't look at that, right? Like, 
console.writeline. Let me let me make it very clear in the code as well, just in case someone still. So this code is not in the if statement. Okay, the second line. This code is in the if statement. Okay, so look. Currently, x x is greater than four, right? X is five. So both of these lines print. Okay, this code is in the if statement. This code is not in the if statement. Okay. So if I change this to a three, so this is now false. Three is not greater than four. This code here that is in the if statement that code this this first line of code, this will no longer print. Okay. So now only the code that is not in the if statement will print. Okay. So this is similar to me going with curly brackets just around this first thing. Okay. So, okay, so no curly brackets at all. Yeah, it'll only run the first line. It doesn't matter what the line is. It doesn't have to be a print, right? It can also be like x equals 6 or something. Whatever, whatever you make that first line, it can be anything. But it's only going to run that first line. Okay. But, but, but remember... By line, we mean until the first semicolon. Okay, that's what I mean by line. Until the first semicolon that it sees. Okay. Think how are you guys feeling about this? Are you okay? It's it's just a trick because obviously when you're going to create an if statement you should always put semicolons. Like it's bad to even teach you this, right? It's bad to teach you this because um, you should never program like this. Like tricks like this should never be used because it makes your code totally unreadable, okay? Um, when you use if statements, always put curly brackets. But because this is a multiple choice test and they want to make it at least slightly difficult, they have to ask you these kinds of trick questions, okay? So when a um, if statement does not have curly brackets, it will just take the first line as being inside the if statement, and everything after that, it'll just run as normal. It will just be run as outside the if statement, okay? It won't only run if the if statement is true, okay? So weird question, it's a trick question, but there you have it that is that is the solution okay so this is what they're trying to test with this question the answer here is number one number two okay because number two is greater than number one so in the end this if statement didn't matter because it evaluated to true okay but if we made this if statement false so if we make number two nine or we make number one twenty one so we make make it so that number two is not greater than number one, then this would only print out number two. Okay. That's what this is this that's what this is testing. It's testing whether or not you know that. Okay. We have been going for one hour. Um so let's take a break. I'm gonna go get some water. Um but yeah hopefully you guys have got this first thing. Um and then we'll do the rest of the multiple choice questions. I don't know if we're going to make it to, yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to make it to the scenario questions, but we'll see. Okay, so come back in like five minutes because I want to get through the multiple choice questions at least. So the answer to, ooh, someone's spoiling, spoiling our next, what is four? Four in a, ah, yeah, 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 you are C, yeah. You are correct. We are, we're going to see that when we come back, though. All right. I, I guess that the, the Simpsons trick is, is good in this multiple choice, right? If you don't know the answer, just guess C and move on. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back. So I'll see you guys in five minutes. All right.
Yeah, yeah, we, we will get one. We'll get to an example of console.readline in one of the later questions. And especially in the scenarios. There's lots of console.readlining in the scenarios. So we'll see it lots. Whether it'll be today or whenever we do the scenarios. I'm not sure if we'll get to the scenarios today. Cool. Yeah, I think let's get started again, just so that we make sure we finish. Is everyone here? Can I start? Post yes, if if you're good to start. If we get a good number of people, then we can just go. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, yeah. I think, I mean, it was we're starting only one minute earlier, I guess, than what I said we would, because it's been four minutes. Okay. Um, anyway. Cool. Question four. Cool. You guys, so this, this I can't really explain to you, right? <laughs> this is just a, um, you know, definition question. So what are they asking about? They're asking about a switch statement, okay? In a switch statement, if you remember, we had three keywords, right? That first one was switch, obviously. Switch, whatever variable we're looking at. And then we give it a bunch of cases. So, you know, case the first case, second case, third case, fourth case, etc. And when we're done giving it all our cases, if we want a catch-all, like if, if none of the cases are true, we still want something to happen, that's called a default case. Right? It's default case. Okay, and so that's all this question is asking. In a switch statements, if none of the case statements match the switch expression, so if none of the cases are true, then control is transferred to which statement so like which statement does stuff if none of the other statements are true and that is the defaults the defaults the default statements okay does someone want to see an example of this or are we okay with this we have seen quite a few switch state switch statements it also makes sense by the name right it's the default case if none of the other cases are true then by default this is what must happen Okay, you want an example? Okay, awesome. Let's let's do that. Shouldn't take too long anyway, so I'll say Okay, we'll create a number, int x is five, okay. Actually I can do a console read line here as well. So I'll say int x equals console dot read line. Okay, something like that, but we'll have to say convert dot to int. Um, we'll do a lot more than this as well, so don't worry. Uh, you think I forgot the exact two? Is it two int thirty two? That's the one. Two int thirty two console dot read line. Okay. So this is just reading in. So this console dot read line reads in a string this line here converts that string to an integer and then I save that integer into x okay don't worry we'll see this more okay we can't see the code you can't can you see this what's what's wrong you can't see the stuff inside dot net fiddle you mean you can't see this what I'm highlighting now. No, yes. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. Um, you can't see what. I'm, okay. Let me. Weird. Okay. I'm gonna try and stop sharing, and share again. Oh, do you want me to zoom in? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Okay, can you see now? Okay, it seems like... Yes. Okay, now I can see. Okay, awesome. So we can see now. Okay, cool. Great. Okay, I don't know what happened there. All right. So I've I this this bit here console dot read line that just reads in something. I then convert it to to an integer. All right, and I save that in X. Okay. I um you don't have to know how to code it yourself, but it's just a bit weird, right? Console dot read line reads in a string, and I want it to be an integer now. So I have to tell it to convert to an integer. Okay. So that's what the convert dot two in thirty two does. Okay, and what's the thirty two? Thirty two is bits, right? So we've seen that now. It's four bytes. Okay. So anyway, we now do switch. Okay, I say switch. I give it what number I want, right? I mean, what variable I'm switching over. Okay, the switch. Um, what do they call each other? Switch expression, whatever. Um, we say this. Okay, normal curly brackets, as always, we always put our curly brackets, okay, and then we say case 1, alright, so if x is equal to 1, then you can print out console.writeLine, um, and let's print out the word, the word that describes the number, okay, console.1, and break, okay, and that's cool, then I can say case 2, uh, let's see, what are we complaining about? Control kind of four from... S okay, yeah, cool, that's fine. Um, case two, and we just say console.write console .write line two. So you see what I'm doing here. You'll type in a number, an integer, and it's going to print out the English name of the number. Okay, so currently I've got two cases, right? So I've got one and two. Okay, so if you type in one, it will print out the word one. If you type in 2, it'll print out the word 2. So let's see that. If I type in 1 and hit enter, it prints out the word 1. Okay. If I type in 2 and hit enter, it prints out the word 2. Okay. Now, what happens if I type in 3? Okay. So I'm going to type in 3, hit enter. You see nothing happens. It prints out nothing. It just just takes the 3 and does nothing with it. Why did it do nothing? Because we only had a case for 1 and 2. So there are a few options here. Either I can go through, I can go case 3, right? Case 3, console.writeLine, 3, okay? Break. So I've added another case now for when x equals 3, okay? And now, when I type in 3, you see it prints out 3. Okay. But, now we, we have the same problem, right? What if I type in 4 now? Nothing happens. But if I want something to happen, let's say I wanted to say, I don't know that number. Okay. If, if it gets any number that it doesn't know, a 4, a 5, a 6, whatever. Oh, screen is gone again. Dang. that fine I think maybe it's because I'm continually opening the chat so I don't know let's see there it's back now ah oh, damn I'm thinking that maybe I can't let me do this ooh can you guys still see okay I'm gonna continue typing okay so what if I didn't want I wanted to be able to go okay one two three okay um, whenever I give it a number greater than that, so 4, it prints out nothing, 6, it prints out nothing. Instead of printing out nothing, I wanted to just say, I don't know that number yet. Okay. In order to do that, so if none of the cases are true, then by default, do this. 
console dot right line I don't know that number yet okay break cool so now when I run this okay when I run this run okay if I type in five what happens is it goes it checks five is not one five is not two five is not three by default I don't know that number yet okay is but can you see now is it okay yes cool okay I think it's this little box here if I close that then maybe it stops I don't know um, but yeah so just by default it runs this final case okay so that's that's all we're saying here you give it a bunch of cases if none of the cases are true then by default do this last one okay So, everyone fine with that example of switch? I know maybe you couldn't see my screen half the time, but um, hopefully that's okay. Are you guys okay with the default expression? So if it goes through every single case, if none of the cases are true, then by default it does something. All right, um, let's get back to the slides now. So the answer to this question was default. And this is just, do you know what a switch statement is? That's all this question is asking. Okay, next question. This this is kind of similar. In a way, all they're asking here is, do you know what a try catch method is? So we did this last time, um, and you heard the answer to this question last time. Okay, you need to write code that closes a connection to a database. You ignore that. I don't care about that. And you need to make sure this code is always executed. So I'll just see always executed, regardless of whether an exception is thrown. Okay, let's see what your answer is. Cool. Um, regardless of whether an exception is thrown. So the word exception, that immediately tells you, okay, we're thinking about error handling, right? Try catch statements. Okay, if you remember what a try catch statement is, so we have the word try, some code that we want to try, the word catch, whatever errors we want to catch and what it, whatever we want to do when we catch them, and the word finally, which goes when all of this is done, regardless of whether or not there are errors, do this. Okay. So let me write this out for you, okay? So um, the example we did of this in last lecture, hopefully you guys can still see my screen. I'm, ah, it's so annoying because it's difficult to check the chat. I don't know why they don't have a chat overlay. I'm thinking I should start just doing a YouTube live stream instead because they handle it much better. Okay, so let's do this. We're gonna say Uh, console dot um, okay right we we did so we said something like using system dot net okay. the example we did of this okay so we say we create something you guys don't worry about this bit um, you're gonna this will all be explained in the next this first line here will be explained in the next lecture okay we create a variable called results and we just say wc dot download string okay download string okay cool and you just give this a website that you wanted to download from Now this is quite high risk, right? A lot can go wrong when you contact a website. A lot can go wrong when we contact a website. Um, so in general, we wanna make sure that there are no errors, right? And if there are errors, we don't want everything to break, okay? So we say try catch. 
catch. Here we just write w the name of the exception we want to catch. Um, so that's the type of exception we want to catch and what we're going to call call it. And then we just print it out. Okay. X. Okay. And then we have this word finally. Right, finally. And I told you we usually use this word finally for cleanup. Okay. So so let me go through what this is doing line by line. Okay. Um, the try catch that is. Okay. So try it's saying okay I'm gonna try running this code okay it creates a variable called results it goes to this website and it just downloads the page okay it just downloads it yeah four it just downloads the page okay it catches an error if that error occurs it'll just print out that error and finally Regardless of whether it catched an error, regardless of the, whether this caused an error, if it worked, if it didn't work, it doesn't care. The word finally means always run this code. Whether or not there is an error, I don't care. Always run this. And this just cleans up. Okay, It just deletes this thing from memory. Okay, So the word finally, that's what we use it for. Okay. Um, it's a bit difficult to explain because you don't know object-oriented programming yet, but the answer to this question is C, okay, within a finally block. So how do you know the answer to this question? You see the word exception, okay, so we're thinking about a try-catch finally statement, okay, because that looks for exceptions and errors, okay always executed regardless of whether an exception is thrown the word finally that's the only word that you're looking for okay but you can kind of yes it's c so you can kind of um stop you can kind of rule out a lot of these okay so within the main method that's obviously wrong code in the main method is it has nothing to do with exceptions right so it's just a uh, that's where we put our code okay within a try block okay that's just code to try again we haven't seen an exception yet within a catch block that code is only run if we do see an exception within a finally block that code is always run regardless of whether there is an exception okay so that's how you can approach that question sort of deductively you know anyway bit of a tough one because you only learned try catches last week and it is a bit of a difficult concept to understand especially since you guys don't know object oriented programming yet anyway question six this one is easy you need to store values ranging from 0 to 255 you also need to make sure that your program minimizes your memory use which data type should you use to store these values answer to uh, a a a cool Yes, you guys are right. It, the answer is bytes. Okay, why? Okay, a byte has eight bits. How many numbers can we hold with an eight-bit number? Um, with eight-bit binary, two hundred and fifty-six. Right, zero to two hundred and fifty-five. Okay, so yes, you guys are all right. The answer to this is A. I'm glad you find this one easy. Okay, um, awesome. Next one. This one's a bit tough. You have seen this error before because we have done it. Um, and we did it in the last lecture. But it is it is a bit hectic. Okay. So the question is, if you don't have a base case in your recursive algorithm, you create an infinite recursion. An infinite recursion will cause your program to throw an exception. Which exception will your program throw in such a case? difficult question okay this this one's tough you guys say a Ooh, it runs out of memory good guess that is a fantastic guess and you guys are approaching this question in the correct way okay so again let's do this okay Connor's just guessing all of them um, so we must <laughs> let's let's see oh wait was this a this a was for the previous question I guess okay but let's approach this deductively okay so um, out of memory exception 
that sounds possible, right? If we're recursing infinitely, we're doing this infinite thing, maybe it makes sense that the computer runs out of memory, okay? B, stack overflow exception. I mean, also possible, right? Something could be overflowing if we're running infinitely, right? It runs out of space, it overflows. That's a good possibility. Divide by zero exception, no way. Right, we know what a divide by zero exception is, right? If we try to divide something by zero, then we get a divide by zero exception. So this that doesn't apply in this case. Okay. Invalid operation exception. Uh doesn't we're not really using an operation here, are we? We're calling we're calling something again and again. It's not an operation, right? Um an operation would be something like an equal to or you know, using something in the wrong case. So it's not C and it's not D. And so we're left with A and B. Okay, we're left with A and B. So what, how, how do we decide? And yeah, it's a tough one if you don't have like a... So the, ans the answer is B. The answer is B. Um, I'm wondering if I should explain what a stack is or just gloss over it. Because in a way... It's something that you can just memorize, right? Which which would you guys prefer? Yes. Okay. That. Okay. Cool. All right. This this is gonna be a bit tough. I'm gonna give you a very very high level explanation because it doesn't. Um, I'm gonna go to that whiteboard again. Whiteboard. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see the whiteboard, but Joshua, you guessed. <laughs> explain. Yeah, sure, sure. We're going to. Okay, so um, let, let me explain this, okay? So the first method we run is the main method, right? Main method. main method okay we're doing recursion uh, forgive my handwriting this is just to explain though okay we've got the main method it's the first one we run okay so let's just plop it down okay we just put it down it's a block okay the main method calls a function okay I'm just gonna call the function f okay okay doesn't matter what the function is Okay, doesn't matter what the function is. Okay, inside f, right, we're talking about recursion. So we've got this function f, right? Um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to define it formally here, obviously. But inside f, this is like curly brackets. Oh gosh, those are terrible curly brackets. That one's, that one's okay, maybe. This is a curly bracket, okay, that thing there. And we've got another curly bracket here. And inside f, we call f again, okay? Infinitely, we never stop doing this, okay? We call f again. And so it builds up this, this thing, okay? So main calls f, f calls f, f calls f again, f calls f again. Okay, and then it happens again. Okay, and it happens again. Cool, and this keeps going up, right? F calls F calls F calls F calls F. All right. Okay, and it does this infinitely. Okay, and again and again. Yeah, exactly. Um, what that means. Uh, or what this is called, rather, let me say that. What this thing here is called is a stack. Okay? A stack. So when you call something, it goes on top of the stack. Alright? It goes on top of the stack. If something returns, then we take it off the stack. So if this f returned something, it would come off the stack. If this returns something, it would come off the stack. If this returns something, it would come off the stack. If this returns something, it would come off the stack. Okay. This is a very high level explanation. Just think about it as like 
a stack of boxes, okay? You take a box, you put a box on top of the box, uh, on that box, on top of another box, on top of another box. Once you take something out of a box, that one comes off, and you, but you see you can only access the top of the stack, right? You can only access the top of the stack. You don't have to understand that whole thing, but that's where the word stack comes from, okay? So when the method calls itself, it adds it to the stack, adds it to the stack, adds it to the stack, adds it to the stack. It does this infinitely, and because it's doing it infinitely, eventually the stack will overflow. Okay, it will overflow. Perhaps. <laughs> it's a Minecraft. Yeah, one stack can hold 64 things. I mean, it, pr it was implemented in a queue, actually. That is the exact same idea. That is actually how they implemented it in Minecraft. Okay? Actually, that's probably a good way of thinking about it for you, right? So if you pick up a piece of dirt in Minecraft, you can picture it as going inside like a long box, okay? And as you put more dirt on top, you can only take off the top, right? So 64 becomes 63 becomes 62. Okay, but eventually, if you try to pick up too much, the stack overflows, and that causes an error, and we call that the stack overflow exception. Okay, but never mind too much about what a stack is. The point really is that's where the name of this exception comes from. You did ask for the explanation, so I gave it to you. Okay, so that's where that name comes from. But if you don't feel like understanding, you don't you don't have to. Okay, um, it's more just like a when they ask you what what error happens when a stack when a recursive calls happen infinitely, you just know it's a stack overflow exception. Okay, because there's a stack and things get added to the stack and eventually it overflows. All right, good stuff. All right, question eight. This is more more in your wheelhouse. Okay. What's happening here? This is interesting. Okay, guys, so look at this one. We've got this code here. So this is a for loop. It has an initial point, okay, int i equals 1. It has a stopping condition, i less than 5, and then nothing. Right, there's a, what's supposed to be here? What's missing? The loop, the loop increments is missing. Right, the loop increments is missing. So, when I ask you the question, how many times will the for loop in the code snippet be executed? What is the answer? Zero, four, five, infinite repetitions? Can you guys not see the screen again? Let's see. D D D. Okay. So let's 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 explore this a bit more, maybe, um, just to make sure you guys are getting it. Um, for those of you who are saying D. That is correct. It is D. Okay. So I've I've got this code here. All right. I'm going to say um, int i equals zero. All right. While i is less than six. Okay. Or five. Let's say. Console dot write line i. Alright, so what's what's happening here? In in your book it's a for loop, right? But I'm just gonna do it as a while loop so you can see it's the same. Okay. So I've I've got int i equals zero, okay, while i less than five, console dot right line i. Alright. So what would you expect, right? We've got an our loop initialization, our loop starts at zero. We've got our loop condition. You would expect me to add a loop increment, right? To so say something like i equals i plus 1, all right? To make i go up each time the loop runs. What the question in your book is asking you is, what happens if I don't add that? 
And I mean, you can see quite easily, right? If I run this, it will just print out zeros forever. Right, you can see it's just printing out a ton of zeros. Okay, printing out a ton of zeros. And eventually it stops and it will say, yeah, time limits exceeded, something like that. Okay. So the answer is D, it will run infinite, infinite repetitions. Okay. Why? Because we say in that for loop, we said int i equals 1 while i is less than 5. And then we didn't tell it how to get from 1 to 5, right? It must add something, okay? We didn't tell it what to add, and so it never, it will never add, okay? So here we've got the, the slides again. Um, infinite repetitions is, is the correct answer, okay? Cool. Ooh. Okay, this is a bit of a tough one. Which of the following C sharp features should you use to organize code and create globally unique types? Okay, I'm gonna open the chat so that I can see your answers. Remember guys, all you should have your textbook with you, so all the questions are actually in your book. Okay, so I do wanna see the chat. Um so let's see, I, I think this D was for the Okay, so someone says A, assembly. No, 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 no. Where, where have you guys seen the word? Uh, so immediately, when you see a multiple choice question, you can immediately exclude things that you've never even really heard of in the course. Okay, we've never discussed or covered assembly. It's definitely not assembly. I can't ask you about assembly. Okay, what things have we discussed? You know what a data type is, right? You've heard of that. You know what a class is, and you know what a namespace is. Okay, so these are our three possible answers. A data type, data types aren't globally unique, right? You've seen a million ints in one piece of code, right? We can create lots and lots of ints. They're all of the same type. They aren't globally unique, okay? So we have two things here, namespace and class, okay? We use classes to organize code and we use namespaces to organize code. So the special thing here is globally unique, okay? Both classes and namespaces organize code, but globally unique, all right? And now you guys are saying namespace and you are 100% right, okay? It is B, the answer is namespace. Why, okay? Classes are not globally unique. Okay, classes are not globally unique. Let's think about it. If I have, you, you've seen this before, right? When we had a namespace called racetrack and a namespace called dealership. And both on the racetrack and in the dealership, we had a class called car. Okay, so there were cars in both of those namespaces. Okay, but you cannot have two namespaces with the same name or then C sharp will get confused, okay? So namespaces are globally unique. Classes are not. All right. So let me go back to the slide, namespace. All right, that is the answer. And I'm glad you guys seem to get that quite quickly. But remember guys, if you don't, if you haven't even heard the word, then you can probably assume that that's not the answer, okay? And on to the last of the multiple choice questions. Um, okay, and this is a big trick question. Okay, so they say, you write the following code snippets. Um, int square brackets, so we're creating a list of ints. Its name is numbers, and it contains one, two, three, and four. Okay, we then say int val equals numbers in position one. Okay. So the first bit of this question is like, okay, what does that mean? What is numbers in position one? Okay, then we say, you also create a variable of the rectangle handler type like this. Rectangle handler, handler. Okay, and then we ask, what is the value of the variable val after this code snippet is executed? Okay, it's all in your book. So I'm gonna go check out the chat, see what people are saying. 
Um, we've got we've got some bees. Let's get more answers. More answers. More answers. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for people. Okay, so why might some of you be hesitant? Why might some of you be hesitant? It's because so there's the second bit that says you also create a variable of the rectangle handler type like this. What? That doesn't that doesn't mean anything, right? That has nothing to do with the question. Okay. So you can see they're just trying to trick you here. Alright. So that second part means nothing. You can totally ignore it. Um, and so our question is more like what is numbers in position one? Okay. And we can see this. Okay, let's let's actually code it up. Right? Most of you were saying B initially, and that's good. Okay. We've got int. I'm creating a list, it's called numbers, and I say one, two, three, four. Okay. Alright. And we literally just have to count. Okay, so if I say console.write line. numbers in position one what do I get okay we can see so I'm gonna I'm gonna put spaces here so that we can more easily label everything okay this we know okay I'm gonna comment okay this we know is position zero okay this we know is position one this we know is position two and this we know is position three. Okay. When we accessing an array, we always start counting at zero, and then it's just normal counting. Okay. But the first entry in your array is always zero. Okay. So when I access numbers in position one, I will get zero, one. I get two. Okay. And get two. Right. And we can see this. Okay, so int numbers, int val equals numbers one, and we can see that the solution to this is two. Okay, it gives you two, and so the answer is B. Okay, how do you guys feel about that? Is that are you fine with that? So you just have to remember, they'll, they'll do all, th all sorts of things to try to trick you. But you have to remember that when you s create an array, you start counting at zero. Okay, The first position in your array is zero. Okay. So that is the full knowledge assessment for, for section one. Um, there are some scenarios still. I think maybe let's do the first scenario. It's not too difficult. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the first scenario. Um, I think yeah. In in the last for the last thing we'll do today, let's just program up um, this scenario. Um, see what's up. Okay, how many sections are there? There are six sections in total. Benele, why are you asking namespace? That was like two questions ago, three questions ago. Okay. <laughs> no, no shame. Maybe it's lag or something. I don't know. Um. But the, the, if you're asking for the question to number nine, question nine's answer is namespace. Yeah, B. B. Okay, why was it that? Because namespaces are globally unique. Okay. And we use them to organize code. Okay. So classes are also used to organize code, but they're not globally unique. You have never heard of assembly before, so you could ignore that. And um, a data type, you know data types aren't unique. And they're not used to organize code either. Data types are to tell the computer what type the variable is. right? So yeah, that was number nine. And 
Number 10, the answer was 2, B. B2. Um, was the answer to number 10. Okay. Cool. So we are now on to scenario 1-1. One, one. You can find this on page 30 of your textbook. Okay, page 30, it's the top thing. I sent that minutes ago, it's my wife. Ah, okay, yeah, so it was lag. All right, it's wondering. Okay, so um, scenario 1-1, one, one, page 30 at the top. Okay. Um, this They give you this decision table, and they say they want you to program a thing that does, like, invoicing, all right, or quoting. Do they say invoicing? Okay, whatever. I mean, maybe I was reading a different question. Anyway, so this is just then a code that calculates the percentage. Okay, and we, we can do that now. So I'm just going to write up code that does this, but we must also know how to read the decision table. Okay, so we've got this code here. So let's just read this decision table, make sure that we understand how to read this. Okay, so we have a variable called quantity and it can hold any value, all right, any, well, yeah, even negative values, it can hold any value, okay, quantity can hold any value, and what we want to determine is, given a quantity, what is my discount, all right, so how do we do this, okay, so if I give you a value for quantity, let's say I give you 9, okay, so I'm going to say quantity is 9, you go to this first column, and there are questions here okay there are three questions in the first column there can be more in this case there are three all right so we ask each question we say quantity it's nine less than ten that's true right the answer to that question is yes nine is less than ten nine is less than fifty nine is less than one hundred okay so the answer to the first question was yes the answer to the second question was yes. The answer to the third question was yes. 9 is less than all three of these numbers. So we find a column that has three yeses. Yes, yes, yes. And the answer is 5%. Okay, our discount is 5%. All right. We ask the second question. Is quantity... Um, um, oh, we would have to get a new quantity, okay? So now I'm going to say quantity is 15. Okay, so quantity was 9 last time, and we got a discount of 5%. What happens if quantity is 15? How do we read this? We say quantity, that's 15, less than 10. Is 15 less than 10? The answer to this question is no. All right. Second question, 15 less than 50. The answer to this question is yes. Um, 15 less than 100. The answer to that question is is yes. Will something like this come in the test? Oh, no, there won't be scenario questions in the test. I could ask you to read a decision table in the test, right? Your tests are only multiple choice, okay? And like fill in the blanks occasionally. Okay, but you don't have to, um, but even the fill in blanks are like drop down lists, so it's still multiple choice. But you'll never be asked a scenario in the test or at least not in the official MTA tests. I can ask you, like in my tests of whether or not you understand work, the ones that I create myself that don't count for marks, I can ask you these kinds of more complicated questions. It depends how how I'm feeling about marking them. Okay, but no, you won't be asked a scenario in your official test for the certificates. Okay. Anyway, so when we ask the first question, 15 less than 10, no, Second question, 15 less than 50, yes. 15 less than 100, yes. Okay, so we got no, yes, yes. We go to the column that has no, yes, yes, and we get a discount of 10%. Let's go extreme. Let's say I'm buying a 1,000, okay? My quantity is a 1,000. Okay, how do we read this? Still super simple, right? A 1,000 less than 10, no. A 1,000 less than 50, no. A thousand less than a hundred? No. So we go to the column with three no's. No, no, no. Our discount is 20%. All right. Does everyone understand how to read decision tables? It's super easy, really. Right? Super easy to read decision tables. OK. 
Okay, everyone happy with that? Stack. Okay, um, so let's see, let's kind of answer this question, okay? So what they say in the scenario, this is quite an easy scenario, this first one. They say, you are developing an, in an invoicing application that calculates discount percentages based on the quantity of a product purchased, okay? The logic for calculating discounts is listed in the following decision table. If you need to write a C-sharp method that uses the same logic to calculate the discounts, how would you write such a program? Okay, so how would we make this decision is all we're saying. Okay, how do we make decisions in code, guys? I'm, I'm waiting for the, someone to post in the chat. How do I make decisions? So if I give you a quantity and I want you to do something if this quantity is less than or greater than or equal to or something. Flowcharts are how we display algorithms. Flowcharts are a graphical representation. We're talking about code now. And yeah, so Ham, Sachin, you guys are right. If statements. We will do this with if statements, okay? We will translate this decision table into if statements, okay? I'm going to do that now. We only have like 10 minutes left, all right? You know, we've actually already been going for two hours, but, you know, we end at four officially. So I'm going to very quickly code this up. Don't worry, the video will be posted. So if it's too fast, you can always go back. But it's very simple. It's just four F statements, okay? So I'll, I'll do it now, all right? And uh, um, it was, Soham, you were asking for an example of a console.read line, so I'm going to do another one here, okay? So I can create an integer. Um, our integer is called quantity, right? Quantity. I'm just going to call it Q, okay? Q for quantity because that's faster to type, okay? I'm going to um, read in an integer so the user can type whatever integer they like, okay? And I'm going to give them back a discount. All right, so I'm going to tell them what their discount is. Okay, how am I going to do this? We have if statements, all right? The first if statement, <clears throat> okay, first if statement, okay, if Q less than 10, right? So where did I get that Q less than 10? You can see it in the decision table, right? The first row the first column, the first row, Q less than 10. That's the first entry in my first if statement, Q less than 10, okay? What happens in this case? We're gonna say console.writeLine, okay, discount is 5%, okay? So if you enter a number that's less than 10, you're gonna get a discount of 5%, okay? Is it? Uh, I, f I forget. Can you do this? Yeah, I think that's allowed. Um, Q less than 50. Okay. Console dot right line. Ooh, let me think about this. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, discounts. Discounts is ten ten percent, yeah. Okay. What's this doing, guys? Do you are you guys okay yeah, we we're just using an if statement, okay? So this is saying if this is true, okay, if Q is less than ten, prints out discounts is five percent. Else if, so if this is not true, else, if this is true, Q is less than 50, then prints out discounts is 10%, then we can say if this isn't true and this isn't true, okay, so we'll say else if Q less than 100, then prints out console.writeLine Discounts is 
And hopefully you guys can see where I'm getting all these numbers from, right? Um, you can see these Q less than 10, Q less than 50, Q less than 100. These is, this is just the first column of my um, decision table. 5%, 10%, 15%. This is just the last row of my decision table, right? And lastly, else. So if all of these things are false, if Q is not less than 10, if Q is not less than 50, if Q is not less than 100, then console.writeLine discounts is 20%. Okay. So that is how we translate a decision table into code. All right. So now if I run this and I give it a quantity, let's say 9, we ran through this example ourselves just now. And you see it says discounts is 5%. If I give it 15, okay, you see it says discount is 10%. If I give it a huge number, if we're buying 1,000 products, um, discount is 20%, okay? And so we just translated this decision table into code, and you can see it's very easy to translate a decision table into code, right? If, else if, else if, else. And for every single column, um, for every single row that you add, right? You just add another else if. Okay, very simple. Could we have used a switch statement? So switch statements will only work on equals to, right? It's like case if this is equal to. Okay, so that's one of the disadvantages of a, of a case switch, of a switch statement. So no, we couldn't have used a switch statement for this um, because you need less than comparisons here and switch statements aren't good at that. Yeah. Okay, cool. We're still three minutes early, but that's because I rushed this hectically. But hopefully you guys are comfortable with this by now, right? Um, we just have a, a question, right? If one question, if this question is true, then we do this. Okay. If this question is not true, so otherwise, elsewhere, you could say, then if this question is true, we do this, okay? If both of these first two questions were false, then we can check this question. If all three of these are false, then we check this question, okay? And this one doesn't even have a question. This is like a default case in a way. We'll base, and I mean, you can see that in the decision table that's reflected quite nicely, right? So technically, if this first question is true, all of these are kind of true, right? But we ignore these ones. All right, but it's 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 quite easy to easy to see. Okay, cool guys. So if you that that last scenario we did run we did rush through it, um, but don't worry, the video will be update uploaded. So if you want to go and see how to translate a decision table into code, then you can. But remember, since all your questions are multiple choice questions think about how that would be asked in a test, right? So they might give you a decision table and say, what structure would you use to translate this into code? And you now know that you'll use an if statement. All right, so we've answered pretty much all the questions other than the last three scenarios. So, hmm, I think how we're gonna do this, so we've done the whole knowledge assessment or at least the important parts of it. Maybe in our next lecture, I'll spend the first little bit giving, um, going over the last three scenarios that we didn't cover. I'm then going to give you a link to an online assessment with some other questions that you can answer. Okay, that assessment, that the link that I'll give you next next week, that doesn't count for marks. It's just for me to gauge what the class is still struggling with, so that maybe we can spend more time on those things. All right, that's, that's all we'll be doing that test for. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we'll do scenarios in the first little bit of next week's lecture, and then you can do that assessment. If you wanna study for the assessment, please do, okay? You can go over basically just these questions, right, the questions we answered today on your textbook. Um, you can go over the logic of why those answers were the way they were, Okay. And if you could revise that before next week and just understand the answer to each question, 
make sure that you know all those definitions, um, then I'm sure you guys will do well in next week's assessments. Okay. Cool. But I think we can call it there for today. It is four o'clock. So I'll see you guys. Sir, is there a way to look at the previous online lectures? Um, yeah, well, the one we did last week, you can look at, right? I posted on the WhatsApp group a link to it. Wait, who asked that question, though? Arav, are you on the WhatsApp group? No, not yet. Okay, um, get one of your friends who is on the WhatsApp group to send me your number, or you can email it to me. Okay, and I'll and I'll add you to the WhatsApp group. Or or you can send me a PM now on Microsoft Teams. Let me. I'll. I'll Cheers, Connor. Um, and yeah, goodbye, guys. Thank you for today, and I'll see you guys next week then, Wednesday, two o'clock. Um, and yeah, Arav, I'll also just send you because yeah, on the WhatsApp group I post all of the online lectures, so you can go ahead and watch them. All right. So do I put my <laughs> this question again? I'm sure you guys asked me this last week or the week before or something. Um, not much. No, I did quite a lot though when um, a while ago. I know I have I have been told that there is a new update coming soon. Okay, but yeah, guys, enjoy the rest of your day. And see you next week, and stay safe. Bye-bye. Um,